title of today's sermon is called Decisions, Decisions. We're going to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, I mean 13 through 14. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. It's a short passage. Let's read it together in one voice. Okay, ready? Let's begin. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is a very narrow, and the road is difficult. But only a few ever find it. Again, today I want to share with you a little bit about decisions, making choices. You know, whether we don't think about it, but do you know that each and every day, each and every moment, we all make decisions. You know, we don't think about them because it comes naturally to us, or we're not conscious of it. But every little thing we make, we have a choice, and we make decision. Even this morning, think about the moment that you woke up to the moment that you came here. Let's think about all the number of decisions that you had to make. Number one, you had to get up and say, should I take shower today or not? Well, I mean, because some people take shower in the evening, you know, or some people, they say, oh, I'm too tired. You know, some of you, you know, you have to, you know, I hope no one is that way. Maybe Josiah, I don't know. You have to decide, should I brush my teeth or should I just close my mouth all day and Hopefully no one will smell my breath. You know? Some of you have to, you know, make a decision about what to wear. Every one of you, you have to decide. The moment you thought to yourself, today I'm going to wear this color, this shirt, this skirt, this blouse. But whatever it was, you had to make a decision as to what you were going to wear. And about, what about eating? You had to make a decision on what to eat. Some of you you have to decide whether you are going to eat or not because I know that some people do not eat breakfast. But if you do, if you were to have eaten, you know, have eaten breakfast, you have to decide, what am I going to eat? Am I going to eat at the cafeteria? Or should I just stay because I feel very lazy, so I'm going to maybe eat a banana in my room. But whatever it was, even what to eat, you had to make a decision. Even whether you should come to church or not, you had to make a decision. You got up this morning and said, oh... It's raining. I don't want to get my pretty hair wet. I spent $80 getting a perm, and if I get this wet, you know, it's a waste of money. And some of us, you know, we even had to make a decision about that. And obviously, the most critical decision, the most important decision that all of us have to make or had made is whether to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. You know, I wish I could stand here today and tell you exactly what decisions are right and what decisions are wrong. I wish I could stand here today and share with you exactly what you can do to be sure that you make absolutely correct decisions, best decisions each and every time. I can't do that because I am not God. And you can't do that because you're not God. But today I want to share with you some principle, the truth about what are some of the reflections, so images of making right decisions. And what are some of the things that reflect us making wrong decisions? We read from Matthew chapter 7 today. And let me read it to you once again. In this passage, it talks about, you know, path to heaven and path to hell. It says, you can enter God's kingdom, that's heaven, only through the narrow, narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. For many that ch who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. Only a few ever find it. This passage tells us not only about our choice, how difficult it is, our choice whether to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and go to heaven and reject him. It's talking about that, but it also gives us more than that. It tells us an idea of, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the ideas and principles? What are some of the things that occur that we need to look out for in, in, in that are, uh, forgive me, I'm a little bit lost, but what are some of the decisions, what are some of the things that reflect a right decision and a wrong decision? Clearly in this passage, it talks about, you know, going to heaven, choosing God is the right decision. But it tells us that that right decision, it gives us some principles as what are some of those things that reflect a right decision. Let me go on to explain. The key word in this passage is 
decision. Decision. He says, you can, you can enter God's kingdom. You can enter God's kingdom. He says, he did not say you did enter. He said, you can enter. And it tells us that, you know, the right gate, the good gate, the path to life is wide. But it says the wrong decision, the path to death is narrow. And it is up to us for us to decide which decision to make. And obviously in this passage, God tells us that we are to take the narrow gate and avoid the wide gate. And the reason why God tells us to make the right decision and avoid the wide gate is because it says the wide gate leads to destruction. Not only in eternity, but also in our personal lives today. The wide gate immediately gives us several images for us to think about. We're not to choose the wide gate. But what exactly is the wide gate? Again, the wide gate, when you think about it, when you visualize it, there's several things that we can get, several things that we can glean from this word. The wide gate gives us an idea, an image of something that is easy, something that is comfortable. The Bible also, in this passage, also tells us that the wide gate is also very popular. So the problem with today, decision-making for many people, is that we tend to make decisions exactly according to the way Bible tells us we shouldn't. Bible tells us that the wide gate leads us to destruction. And the wide gate gives us an image, an impression of something that is easy, something that is comfortable. And also, Bible tells us it is also very popular. I don't know about you, but you know, whenever I go to the subway or, you know, or, or so forth, I always look for the line that is the shortest. I always look for the one, you know, maybe the escalator with less people. I always try to decide, should I take the escalator or the elevator? And I look for the ones that has less people, more space. Why? Because one with less people and more space is obviously much easier for me. It's much comfortable for me. And let me just say this. That's not just my decision, but that is also the decision that most people would tend to agree. The first thing that I want to share with you today is that we need to avoid making decisions simply based upon and looking at things that are easy. As I mentioned, it is much easier for us to go toward the wide gate. There's no hassle. There's no waiting. There's no crowd. You know, I want to talk about Amiti. You know, other pastors, usually when they talk about church members, they get their permission first. I'm not one of those pastors. I just talk about my members whenever I feel like it. You know, Amiti, bless her heart. Did you make it okay today? You know, for those of you that uh, do not know, last weekend when we went on a singles retreat, we rode ATV, all-terrain vehicle. It's like a motorcycle with four wheels. You know, I think they should put a label, you know, only strong people should do this. <laughs> Actually, Amiti was an excellent driver. She did really well. She was in the front driving all these things, and she did a good job. Now, bless her heart, she, I think, made a wrong turn, and her ATV flipped over. You know, normally when there's an accident, when, a, when my son falls off a bike, bicycle, when my daughter you know, falls riding a rollerblade. I don't make a big deal. I don't go like, ah, because if I do that, it just makes it worse for the, you know, the child, you know. So I try to play it cool. But when Amiti flipped over, I did something I don't normally do. I immediately braked, and I got up, and I ran towards her because I saw the ATV land on top of her. And I went, and I used my super strength, and I lift up the ATV all by myself with one finger, and then I saved her life. Not really, but I did, you know, help her get up. You know, bless her heart. You know, she was hurt and, and she was limping throughout the whole week. That, that's not the story that I wanted to share. What I wanted to share was that, and I really appreciate Amiti because I remember, you know, last semester I, when I first asked her about campus ministry, you know, she didn't really expect it. She didn't know what to expect. But I, I asked her, you know, to really join with me and work with me in doing Chungnam National University's Bible study. And I remember the first few meetings, I was really impressed because, you know, our Bible studies every Tuesday night at 6 p.m., but then Amiti would show up 
all dressed up, with, heart, with their hair all made up, you know, makeup and stuff like that. I'm like, wow, you know, do you always dress like that? And I would tease her, is there a boy here that you're trying to meet after the Bible study? You know, she's all dressed up and pretty. I'm like, wow, you know, you know she's, wow. I, I wouldn't be able to look that good at that time of the night, but, you know, she looked good. But, you know, you, know, you can't judge any, you know, everything by a short period of time because as time went by, weeks went by, a couple of months went by, you know, slowly I could tell that, you know, she kind of, you know, didn't care about her looks. Because nowadays, you know, she oftentimes always comes with her hair just tied up in the back with a cap sometime, sweatshirt, and no makeup. You know, there's a Korean saying, you know, uh, do, do you, what do you really believe in? Like, Korean word is like, 모를 믿고 이렇게 다니냐, you know, like, it means, you know, what is it, what do you believe about yourself that you feel so confident that you can go around looking like that, you know? Maybe you must be rich, a millionaire or something, you know? But the point I'm trying to make is this. It's not really easy for Amiti to do this campus ministry on Tuesday night. You know, she has basically two jobs. She's, a, she's an English teacher, and also she's a broadcaster. And her broadcasting is late at night from 10 to 11 p.m. It doesn't mean she goes there at 10 o'clock and finishes at 11. She goes before that, she prepares, and then afterwards she has to wrap up. And then when she comes home, you don't just immediately fall asleep. She oftentimes tells me she's, she sleeps during the day because she doesn't go to bed right after, you know, she comes home. And then Tuesday she gets up and then she goes to teach English. And then as soon as she finishes, you know, she has to come. And I could tell that oftentimes it wasn't easy for her. And oftentimes it was physically exhausting and so forth. And I know that if she had a choice, she would prefer to rest every Tuesday, Tuesday night, not come to Chungnam University and stick around for about two, three hours. But again, you know, I, I respect her and commend her because when she made that decision to be one of the leaders at CNU Bible Study, it wasn't really based on whether it was going to be easy or not. I think if she thought about that, she wouldn't have done it. But her decision was not based upon what was easy. Because she knew that that's not how you make decisions. That's not how you make right decisions. When we make decisions based upon simply because it's, simply because it's easy, ultimately it will lead to destruction. Think about your family, for those of you who are parents. Think about the decisions that you make for your children. Do you make decisions that are easy or do you make decisions that are hard? The easiest thing for us to do as a parent is guess what? Let our children just watch TV all day and let them eat whatever they want to eat. That is the easiest thing for us to do. You know, my son and daughter, my daughter Faith hates to eat. We have to fight her all the time to finish her meals. My son and daughter, neither one of them likes to eat vegetable. We have to fight with them all the time. William doesn't like to study. We really have to use our head and encourage him constantly to study. The easiest thing for, him, for us to do is just like, oh, you know, maybe pay all our money you know, send them to Hagwon and spend a lot of money and send them there and hope, hope that, you know, they'll learn, they'll get their education that way. That's the easy way. But I know, I know all of you, you don't do that. You don't choose the easy way because you know in your heart the easy way only leads to destruction. And because of that, you have decided in your heart to make the hard decision, to spend your own time with your children, encouraging them. And to even though you may get tired and exhausting, always fighting with them, you make sure that your children eat vegetable. You make sure your children watch the right TV program. You check up on them. You make sure that your children are practicing their piano. Even though it's tiring for you. Even though it's exhausting for you after all day, you know, working all day. Because you all know that making a simple decision based upon what is easy, and choosing what is easy, you know it only leads to destruction. Just like what the Bible teaches us. You know, even for me when I come home, after a long day's work, when I come home, you know, usually taking the bus. You know, taking the bus was fun only for a little while. But after a while, you get tired. Especially on the way back, there are no seats and you have to stand up. You know, and the bus driver doesn't know how to drive. And you're like, kung, kung, all, the, all the way home. And sometimes when I ride my bicycle home, you know, the last thing I'm thinking about is going home and wrestling with my son, you know, being a practice partner for his taekwondo or, you know, doing, you know, you know, doing airplane ride with faith or going out on a walk 
because they always want to go outside, ride a bicycle, rollerblade, or go to Lotte Mart. They don't want to stay home. And the easiest thing for me to do is to go, come home, eat my dinner, watch a little bit of television, read the internet, newspaper, and then go to bed. But I know that that's not what's good for my family. The heart, so I choose what is hard. Even though I may be tired, I go, you know, I, spend, I try to spend time with the kids. You know, go to Lotte Mart. They love to walk. They do their jump rope. They're all the way there, you know. It's a good time for my wife and I to talk also. But we do that once again because easy decision, making decisions based on, you know, what is easy, looking at what is easy, only leads to destruction. That's why we make decisions that are hard. You know, even at church, uh, you know, some of us, you know, when I make decisions here for church, I want you to know that I don't always make the easy decisions, but I make difficult decisions. You know, as a pastor, I carry a, believe it or not, I carry a lot of responsibility and burden during every event to make sure that everything, is, everything goes well. First of all, to make sure that all of you guys show up. Secondly, when you do show up, that you guys have a great time. Because I feel like whenever I plan something, I bear the responsibility. You know, for example, how many of you thought about the softball game that we have on October 11th? How many of you guys thought about that this week? Yeah. Maybe some of you once because you're excited. But let me tell you, I thought about that each and every day. In fact, I prayed about it almost every day. I pray about the weather. I wonder whether we're going to have enough people. And I really wonder whether their church is going to have enough people. And whether the people that come afterwards, that stay around, whether you guys are going to have, you know, really a good time. You know, I don't make decisions about church because they're easy. If it was easy, I would probably not plan anything. Just come here and preach on Sunday and, uh, and then go home. But I know that making decisions purely based, you know, choosing, based on choosing what is easy, it only leads to destruction. If I were to be a pastor like that, this church would die. And because of that, I make hard and difficult decisions. And I want you to know that almost all the members here at All Nations Community Fellowship, you know, we are here today, and our church is the way it is today, because many of our members have made a very difficult decision, hard decision, but they made a right decision to serve, to give, and to commit. Again, one of the things that we need to avoid in making a decision, a good decision, is to avoid simply choosing an easy decision. The second thing that we need to understand in making the right decision is that we need to avoid making decisions simply based upon what is comfortable. What is comfortable. You know, the wide gate often it also indicates a path that is comfortable. Think about it. You guys have lived in Korea for months, some of you for years. You know how uncomfortable it can be being in a crowded place, in a narrow place, the elevator, you know, the hallway. But when you're on a wide road, that's why I really like Daejeon so much. It's not like typical Korea, especially Seoul, where everything is crowded. But Daejeon is a lot like America in some ways. The narrow, the wide gate also symbolizes and signifies, and signifies something that is comfortable as well as being easy. You know, oftentimes we're tempted to make decisions based on comfort. You know, let me just share with you. The Bible teaches us what the Bible teaches us. Uh, on the consequences of making decisions based upon comfort. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but on Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 to 27, it's a parable about talent. It's about a master who gave a certain amount of money to his servants. And when he went away, he told his servants, I want you to work this money. You know, do as you please. Work it and try to you know, uh, grow, make it grow. Well, the first two servants, when he came back, well, guess what? They did their job, as what the master said. They worked it. They invested it. They planted it. Somehow they made the money grow. Because, you know, but in order for it to grow, they had to do something. They worked it. They sweat. They gave their effort and energy. But the last servant, actually, he said, you know what, master? I, I, you know, I was afraid of you. I thought, you know, maybe you were being unfair, you know, what you were asking me. So I didn't do anything. Basically, the last servant was just making an excuse. Basically, in my opinion, the last servant didn't want to go through all the work of trying to you know, increase the amount of money. He just wanted to do something that was easy and comfortable. And the easiest thing for him to do was not do 
anything. But here's the thing that we need to remember. The master replied to this servant. This was God's response. He says, you wicked and lazy servant. God called him, you wicked and lazy servant. This story is an example of, of a person who made a decision sorely based upon choosing what was comfortable. One of the worst mistakes that we can make is as Christians, when God gives us opportunity to serve, you know, we start calculating. You know, we start calculating in our brain how much work it's going to you know, take, you know, how much time it's going to cost us, how much sacrifice that we have to make, and even whether we're going to enjoy it or not, whether we're going to like doing things or not. I remember when I was young, you know, the most favorite coveted job was you know, you know, to be the president of the high school group. You know, because it's a position of authority. You know, I calculated. I said, you know, it's not much work, but I thought it's a good place to, you know, get respect from people and, 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 so, and be liked and so forth. You know, again, we all calculate in our mind. When someone comes to you with work, when someone comes with you with opportunity, don't you do that? When someone comes to you with a job opportunity, do you just immediately say, yes, I'll take it? No. You talk about, well, how, what do I have to do? Uh, how much time is it going to take? Uh, how much money am I going to be compensated? We immediately calculate in our head. But think about it is, we cannot apply that type of principle when it comes to doing God's work. But oftentimes, we tend to do the same thing. When God gives us opportunity to serve, when God gives us opportunity to do certain things, immediately in our brain, we start calculating. Okay, how much time? How much energy? How much time do I have left? You know, is that really going to be good work? You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. You know, God gave us brains for a reason. You know, we are to calculate and use our wisdom. But we cannot forget that when God gives us opportunity, it wasn't, it's not because necessarily for us to calculate. But when God gives us opportunity, when God tells us to do something, our immediate obligation and our first thought should not be, you know, to, you know, take out our brain calculator and calculate, but for us to say, God, what is it? You know, there's a saying in the U.S. Army, when, a, when, a, when your sergeant, when your commanding officer tells you to jump, you don't say why. You simply say, how high? It's the same principle with God. Oftentimes, when we make decisions at church, we tend to calculate too much. But when God says, you know, Luke, I want you to do certain things, you don't ask why, God. But the first response should be, you know, how high? And then you can think about later, why did God call me to do that? You know, let me just say that I feel very fortunate and blessed to be doing what I'm doing here at All Nations Community Fellowship. You know, when I pray, I'm always reminded of how blessed my life has been for the past, you know, not only 20 years or 10 years or 5 years, but even the past 2 years that I've been here at Tejan. You know, it wasn't easy. It really wasn't. And I'm not saying that because I want your pity. No ministry is easy, especially the ministry that we did together. We started with nothing. We had about 25 people. And it wasn't easy, and we had a difficult time. But even with all of those things, I really consider myself very blessed. You know, even now, let me just say, and I just want you to, don't get me wrong, I am not by any means complaining. In fact, I am really thankful when I say this. And that, you know, right now, having two jobs, it's not easy. You know, whether you guys think about this or not, but I basically have two full-time jobs. I have a one full-time job at Chungnam National University, and I have a second full-time job here, being a pastor at All Nations Community Fellowship. You know, at Chungnam University, I have to say, it's a, it's a job that God gave me. But there are times when it's not so easy. You know, there are papers to grade, quizzes to grade, lots of papers to grade, exams to prepare, lesson plans to prepare, because I'm teaching whole new classes. And it's not easy. And on top of that, there's the church work of preparing sermon each and every week. And I really just try to spend a lot of time, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours, not all in one day, but spread out. And along with that, I, I make bulletins. I write pastor's desk. Uh, I, I oversee events. I plan events, activities. I'm constantly writing emails, updating home pages. And, and every day, you know, I either ride, ride the bike and, or take the bus home. It's not easy. Just to let you know, it's not easy. 
And on top of all that, hosting singles group house church, you know, every Sunday night at my house, that's not easy too. Well, let me just be honest with that. My wife does most of the work in that, not me. But even for my wife, Esther, it's not that easy for her. You know, she's a full-time mother. You know, for those of you who are mothers, you understand, you agree with me how hard it is. You know, constantly, dishes never stop. Doing laundry never ends. Cooking never ends. Helping your children with homework never ends. It's a never-ending task. But on top of that, my wife also has another full-time job. She teaches at our kindergarten. And on top of all that, she works with the children's department. And for, us to, for her to come home, she has to come home early. She has to clean the house, get ready for the visitor, you know, the guests. And then on top of that, every week, she's always asking me, Honey, what should I cook for dinner? Let me say this. I love, I love you, brothers and sisters from India. But you're not easy to please when it comes to food. Not please, but, you know, you're, we have so many vegetarians along with Matthew. So my wife, whenever she cooks meals for our Indian brothers and Matthew, she has, always has to prepare two menus. One for people like me. I like to eat meat and all these things. And then another menu for vegetarian. It's a lot of work for her. And she stresses over what to cook. You know, leading Alpha course on Sunday was not easy for me either. It was not an easy decision. It was not a comfortable decision. It means it's an extra work. Uh, extra work, extra preparation. And usually on Sunday after I preach, when I'm done, right now I feel okay because Holy Spirit was with, with me. And I, you know, when I'm preaching, I feel strong. But when it's done, <laughs> you know, my body becomes a jello. And after that, you know, in, in the States, after usually preaching, when I go home, I always fall asleep on the couch. I'm just mentally that exhausted. You know, so for me to stay afterwards and to teach Alpha Course, it's not the most easy, easiest or the comfortable decisions. Even the decision at, and this is the point I was trying to make, even a decision to do, for me also, CNU Bible study. And I shared with this with Amiti, I think, a couple of weeks ago, that you know, I told her that preparing Bible study every Tuesday night is like preparing another sermon. I have to do all the same type of research. In fact, it's a little bit more difficult because I actually have to come up with worksheet with questions and, where, and so forth. And, um, but when I made that decision, you know, I, I told myself, you know, it's never about me, about being comfortable. But I wanted to make a decision based upon what was right. And I prayed about it. I really prayed about it. I said, God, do you want me to do this? The reason why I shared all this thing was not to get your compassion or pity. I'm very fortunate to have my job at CNU. I am so thankful to be a pastor here. But at the same time, I, I hope you will agree with me that what I do is not easy. It's not the most comfort, comfortable for me, even though I am thankful and I'm grateful for it. But when the CNU Bible study thing came, I prayed about it. And I said, you know, the easiest thing for me was like, you know what? With school, new school, new curriculum, and then with church and Alpha course I'm about to start and all the other activities, you know, it's going to be too busy for me. And the com most comfortable thing for me to do was say, you know what, maybe not. But then I prayed about it. And when I prayed about it, the answer was a no-brainer. That means answer was obvious. When I prayed about it, God specifically told me, I sent you to Chungnam National University for a reason. There are many reasons, but there were reasons. I sent you to Chungnam National University because, first of all, I wanted to give you a less stressful job. You know, because many of you do not know this, but I'm going to make it brief. Uh, I only get part-time salary here. I need to make a living. So I need to have a job. And I was working at a public school, and that was very stressful. And I prayed to God. I said, God, I'm going to quit because I did not come here to make money or teach at a school. I came here to serve you. And somehow God just opened doors and I'm, you know, we have Andy and Mark and Matthew. These guys are smart, PhD, brilliant, you know. And Matthew even speaks original English. You know, we Americans speak secondhand English. And, uh, and I'm not the most qualified to be a professor, but I got this job. God gave me this job. And God said, I gave this job to you for a reason, to better work at church. But more importantly, God told me, I'm sending you to CNU because I want you to minister to the students at CNU. See, when I made a decision, thinking about the decision of whether to do Tuesday Bible study, 
It was not about, oh, do I have time? Even though that's important. It wasn't about, oh, do I have energy? Is it going to be comfortable? Is it going to be hard? Even though that is an issue too. But it was more about, what does God want me to do? Why did God send me here? And when I prayed about that, it was a no-brainer. And let me tell you this. When God gives us opportunity, and when we make the right decision, there's a tremendous amount of blessing that comes your way. And when we do not accept that decision, simply based upon our comfort, we're missing out. I can't speak for Amiti, but I bet during the singles retreat, there was a tremendous amount of joy and satisfaction on your part when so many people came and enjoyed. And not only that, they came and they came again. You know? For me, I found great satisfaction too in seeing your Bible study. Even today, you know, Oyuka and Ondra, two beautiful young ladies. And if you go to Mongolia, all the Mongolian girls are abused, as beautiful as these two girls. So all of, you, all of us, we should, okay, not me, I'm married. All the single men, we should all move to Mongolia. My point is this, they're beautiful young ladies, not just outside, but on the inside. And for me, even this morning when I came, Andra and Oyuka looked at me and they had this smile on them when they saw me, this, I'm so happy to see you type of look. You can't buy that with money. That is a type of blessing that does not come your way when you're always seeking what is comfortable. I don't know whether I should say this, but I, I know that on, uh, Oyuka mentioned that, ah, you know, you know, we think you're a good man. You know, me and Zaya, we think you're a good man and, and so forth. And I said to myself, why do they think I'm a good man? They don't know me well, you know, because in reality, I'm a bad boy. Uh, that's a joke. There's a song in Korea called Bad Boy. And, but I think they said that because of the decision that they saw me make, that every night, you know, I come and I teach, even though I'm busy, even though it's not the most comfortable thing. And again, when you make a decision, not just based on comfort, but based on what God is saying, there's a tremendous amount of blessing that comes your way. So when we make a decision, we need to avoid making decisions that are simply because it's easy or simply because it's most comfortable. But lastly, we need to, make, we need to avoid making decisions simply based on what is popular. What is popular. Matthew also tells us that the wide gate and the wide path, there are many people on it. Obviously, it is a very popular path. But the Bible tells us that when we make decisions simply based upon what is popular, that too will also lead to destruction. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that all of the right decisions are unpopular or discomforting or difficult. It's not. But we should not make decisions solely based upon those qualifications of being easy or comfortable or popular. If that's how we make decisions, then our lives and our family and all the things that we do would lead to destruction. You know, over the years, I made many decisions that were not popular with church members. I remember one time when I went on a, I took a bunch of high school students on a mission trip to Afghanistan. I'm telling you, it was not popular. In fact, I had some parents who were very, very upset. And I even had a couple of parents who went to the senior pastor to try to convince me of otherwise. But that didn't work. I remember when I, again, this is years ago, I tried to do house church, our family group ministry for our youth group, students. That too wasn't popular with parents because they didn't want to give ride to, the, to their children every Saturday night and they didn't want to open up their home because when you do family group, you have to open up your home and then, you know, if you're the host family, you have to cook and clean and it was not the most popular. But let me just say that I went, I've been to Afghanistan three times and twice I took a bunch of students. And it was the most, most rewarding, life, I don't want to say life-changing, but really uh, eye-opening trip, not only for me, but for the students. Simply because going to Afghanistan, it's a dangerous place. I have never seen students pray so hard in preparation for their mission trip to Afghanistan. I've never seen moms and dads pray and fast. My wife Esther, she skipped dinner for nearly six weeks. <laughs> she lost about 10 pounds, no, 20 pounds maybe. Every night, she skipped meal and she skipped dinner to pray. And it really changed the dynamics of our youth group, the students, and the parents. 
It really helped them to increase their faith. But it wasn't the most popular decision. When I did the family group ministry for children, it wasn't popular because it was not most you know, comfort, comfortable and easy for the parents. But let me tell you, the youth group, originally we had about 100 people start with family group ministry. Within six months, that number grew to 160. Within, within a year, it grew to 180, the number of participants. And kids loved it. They grew spiritually. They invited their school friends. Again, it wasn't the most popular. But when I make decisions, I don't make decisions based on what I think is popular. But I make decisions based upon what I believe God wants me to do. You know, as Christians, we must understand that we do not live in a democracy. We live in a theocracy. It is not about who, you know, you know, how many percentage of people want this or that. Only thing that really matters is what God wants. And we need to understand that. It's not that majority rules. It is what God wants that rules. In the wide gate, there are many. But let me put that in another perspective. There was a senator named James Reed from Missouri. He made a speech a long time ago, and he really made a good point about the majority. He made a point that let's, he, said, he told everybody, let's remember that it was the majority that crucified Jesus, that killed Jesus. Majority of the Jewish people wanted to kill Jesus. We need to remember it was the majority that burned the Christians at the stake, the Roman Empire. We need to remember that it was the majority that established, established slavery. It was the majority that jeered and you know, criticized and made fun of Columbus when he said the world was round. Christ, Jesus always called us to follow the lifestyle of the minority when you really study the Bible. Let's not be deceived by the loud voice of the majority. Majority is not always right. What is popular is not always right. It's not, it doesn't matter what people think. It matters what God thinks. Life is about a choice. Life is about freedom to make those choices. Because God loves us so much, He will not impose His will. He gives us freedom to make decisions. But we must understand that those decisions, it comes with a consequence. When we make the right decision, our lives are filled with blessings, change lives in every area of our lives. But when we make the wrong decision, the consequence is great. It leads to destruction. More specifically, the Bible says, it leads to the path to hell. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 through 20, it tells about God told Moses to tell his people that they need to choose who they were going to serve. I'm going to just go through quickly. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Before entering the promised land, Joshua told the people to choose this day whom they would serve. In Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, Elijah stood in front of the prophets of Baal, false gods, and he told them to this day to choose either to follow the one and only true God or follow your God, Baal. God never forced us to follow him. He always gave us a choice because he loves us. And he knows that true love cannot, can never be forced. So the question that is beckoned upon us today is, what decision will we make? God has brought all of you here for a reason. Not only to Korea, but also to this church. And God has brought you here to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Now it is time for you to make a decision. Not an easy decision, not the most comfortable decision, and not the most popular decision. But God has called us to make the right decision. And I hope that we will all, through our relationship with Jesus Christ, 
live our lives making the right decisions in every part of our lives. Let us pray.